If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, and I'll be reading before we start verses 5 through 11. But before we start, we have a lot of visitors that's here this morning, and we want to thank you for coming to Cornerstone and visiting us here. But we also have a special guest, and for you old-timers, we'll know Luke McFadden and his wife. Hang on a second. Megan, I, I remembered. And uh, if you don't know them, Luke is the pastor at Christian Neighbors Community Church in, in Waukegan. Uh, Luke and his family was a part of this church for a little while and sent off from here, planted the church there. He's been on sabbatical for a little while. Luke, how long you been at it down there? 13 years, and this is his first major break, so continue to pray for him as he's had a time of rest, and I know he's anticipating getting back with his congregation. If you know him, make sure you say hey to him. If you don't know him, introduce yourself to he and his family, and uh, it's good to have you guys with us this morning. Um, if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, these are the words of God. But you shall seek a place that the Lord your God would choose out of all the tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of the herd of your and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household, and all that uh, and all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord God has given you. But when you have go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all of your enemies around so that you... Uh, uh, you live in safety. Then the, the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his uh, name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, one thing that we have to acknowledge as we read your word is the acknowledgement is that you have been very active in the world. Since the very beginning, Father, uh, you have been active doing and accomplishing your good will, doing your good pleasure in all the events of man. And Father, even this very day as Israel is at war, with Hamas and other Arab countries, Father, that, uh, that play into this, Father, we recognize that this is not anything that has escaped your will in this world. God, you use all things to, to work out your good pleasure. So this morning as we come to this passage and we consider uh, a biblical theology of missions and we focus upon Jerusalem and the new covenant relationship that, Lord, you will help us to see that even as, as non-Jews, as, as Gentiles, you have made a place for us. We play a part in, in, in what you're doing in the world and, Lord, we thank you for that. May we, through your word, be edified today. May you be glorified in us. Help us to respond in a way that would be pleasing to you. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You may be seated. Now, I'm going to ask you a broad, general question this morning. How do you see yourself as a child of God? Especially as it relates to His overarching plan, His God's scheme in the world. And I think it's only right that we see ourselves in the correct manner. In one way, it's important for us to not to think too highly of ourselves, right? To think ourselves really too important. But on the other hand, in the, maybe if the pendulum should swing the other direction, it's important for us also not to see ourselves as insignificant to, to what God is doing in the world. And what I'm really trying to get at this morning is I want us to see ourselves as God sees us. And ask yourself this question, do you see yourself as significant or insignificant? Do you see yourselves as maybe the human tendency is, is to see yourself as so insignificant that you yourself may not even be on God's radar? I hope that today's message will help you become aware maybe of your significance Maybe if it's even not as an individual, but as a, as a part of the body of Christ, as a part of the church that is God's universal church in the world, and that you, that being that we are a part of God's redemptive plan in the world. And that's not insignificant. When we look at what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, and for you newcomers, those that's visiting here, uh, this is not uh, a message that developed since the time of the war. This is a message that God had, for whatever reason, put on my heart long before the war that's going on in in Israel in this moment. But for some reason, he's brought us here to these passages. And I'm thankful for that. But I I really want us to walk away with this idea that whoever you are, that if you are in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, that you and I, that is we, play a significant role in God's redemptive plan in the world. Over the past couple of weeks, we have started on a journey, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm used to preaching one verse at a time. I'm used to starting in the beginning at the book of Timothy and slowly and methodically working my way through verse by verse. But for whatever reason, God moved me to do this overarching, grand, sweeping narrative of God's redemptive plan through history. And it's been no easy task for me, nor has it you, because I think last week, by the time we got out of here, we were all sweating And just like we ran a marathon working through all those long passages of Scripture. But we have started in the beginning with the fall of mankind, the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. And we have talked about the spread of sin as really that being the impetus for God's plan to redeem the world. You see, God promised even in the book of Genesis that he would send a deliverer. And later on, after the spread of sin and God's promise to send a deliverer into the world that would one day defeat the serpent, as is promised in Genesis 3.15, in Genesis chapter 12, we see God's promise to a calling and promise to Abraham, that Abraham would be blessed and that he would have many descendants, that Abraham himself and his descendants would become a great nation. And through that promise, that God promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations. And in in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 tells us that because of Abraham's calling, that all of the families of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 promised Abraham not only would he be a blessing to his descendants and to the nations and to all the families of the earth, but he also promised uh, God also promised Abraham that he, there would be a land for his descendants. You see, God honored his promise 
to Abraham, or the promise that he gave to Abraham. Genesis further on tells us not only did God honor Abraham, but he passed that blessing on to his son who was named Isaac. And God renewed his promises that he had made to Abraham with uh, Abraham's son Isaac. And that blessing was even passed on to Isaac's son named Jacob. Jacob, whom God had changed his name to Israel. And if you know that story, that Jacob bore 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel, if you read and summarize much of the Old Testament, we know that Israel was taken into slavery by the Egyptians. We know that Moses delivered them. And then after Moses delivered them out of the hands of in the Egyptians and they, God parted the Red Sea they, they, uh, and moved to the other side, that the children of Israel began to murmur. They were not pleased with what God had done and what God had provided. And we know that because of the rebelliousness of their hearts, that the children of Israel uh, remained on the outside of the promised land for some 40 years, wandering in the wilderness. But yet we know that the scripture teaches us that God finally permits Israel to enter into the promised land under the, the leadership of Joshua. Now, this is a, that long, overarching story of the history of the redemption of Israel and God's overall plan to redeem the world. And this is kind of where we find ourselves in that larger story. And this morning, I want to skip ahead a little bit, and I want us to focus on not only the land that God had promised the nation of Israel, and that God had originally promised to Abraham, as we read this morning, I out of the book of Psalms, but I want us to specifically look at Jerusalem and the new covenant. Jerusalem, and I'm going to give us, we'll have three sub points today. Three things if you want to write those down, and I know that uh, the outline that you have is a little bit jacked up, and it, that it, it's not working real well, but we're only going to cover point C today, so you'll have to write in and around all the other points there. I apologize for that. But the first thing that I want us to see this morning is I want us to see Jerusalem as the world's center. Jerusalem as the world's center, that is biblically speaking. But if you want to jot this down as a note, we, lest we forget that Jerusalem should be, or Jerusalem as Israel's center. You see, when, when, when the children of Israel go back into the promised land, Israel is still realizing God's promise to Abraham. God, has promised, God had promised Abraham land, and that land we know would be found in the land of Canaan. And after the exodus from Egypt and the wilderness experience, God, under the leadership of Joshua, took the children of Israel into the promised land, yet there was something more. You see, God's promised them that, they, that he would be with them and that he would make his habitation among them. And this place would be a special place, a place where he would ultimately sh show them. Now, I'm going to go back to this passage and just give a brief commentary as we read through. But if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 12, notice what it says in verse 5. But you shall seek a place. The wording of this is really not too different from the wording, you know, that God gave to Abram in the very beginning when he told him to leave his kindred, to leave his family, to leave the land of Ur, and that he would go to a place that ultimately God would show him. In other words, Abraham was going to have to, or Abram would have to leave his family, leave his culture, step out on faith because God did not give him a specific destination at this point. But as for, the, for this particular place, he, 
it's, 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 it's kind of spoken of, if you would, in general. But you shall seek a place that the Lord God would choose out of all of your tribes to put his name and to make his happen, habitation there. And there you shall go. So this promise made in Deuteronomy to the Israelites was somewhat vague. But as you go into the land, here was God's promise. I'm going to give you a special place, and I will show you where that place will be. Verse 6, And there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and your contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. In other words, this place, this special place, will be a a particular place where all the children of Israel could worship God. Now think about it. We have the privilege post-resurrection of Christ, that no matter where we go in the world, we can worship God freely. We can worship God because God has given us the Spirit of God, and He resides within us. And if we gather together, whether it be two or three, or whether it be a hundred or 120 or 5,000 people, that God's people can worship Him at any time in any place. But for the children of Israel, this was not exactly so. For all the children of Israel did not have the Holy Spirit residing within them. The Holy Spirit led them. The Holy Spirit directed them. The Holy Spirit did miraculous works in the life of Israel. But for Israel to worship the one true God, God had determined that there was a specific place and where his name would be and where the children of Israel would bring their offerings, would bring their sacrifices and their tithes and all these things, and they would come together in this particular place and they would worship God. But I love the wording of verse 7. And going back, it reminded me of even uh, Russ's passage, and there you shall eat. You shall eat. Eating, you know, collectively as a people is, is, is a time where, where, where community and bonding comes together and is formed. And it says, and before the Lord you got, and you shall rejoice. Now, how many of you like to gather together to eat, as we say in Louisiana, to pass a good time together, to rejoice? But this was to rejoice in the Lord, in communion with Him, in the worship of Him. And this is what God so desired of His his people. Verse 8 says, You shall not do according all that you're doing here today, everyone doing whatever's right in their own eyes. For you have not as of yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God has given you. You're not there yet. There's more to come. There's more to do. Uh, What I want you to do is to get to the place where I want you to be. Verse 10 says, but when you go over the Jordan, they were east of Jordan. When they cross over the Jordan River and you live in the land that the Lord God has given you to inherit. And when he gives you rest from all of your enemies around so that you live in safety reminds us of what's going on today. Israel is in the land, but I don't think that they, in, in, t- in this particular time, live in safety. And then to the place where the Lord your God would choose, this specific particular place, to make his name there, and there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, and all of your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord." You see, this place that he was describing here was was a special place. It was a significant place. It would become what we know as... Anybody? Jerusalem specifically, right? Sorry, I put you on the spot. 
but it would, it, would be, it would be Jerusalem, the land that God promised to Abraham in which God renewed that promise ultimately with Isaac uh, and then given to Jacob was now have a centralized place of worship for God's people. There they would make sacrifices and burn offerings and they would give their tithes to the Lord and they would worship him and he would be their God and he would ultimately make habitation among them. This place, as we've already noted, is what we now call Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be the center of the Hebrew world or the center of worship for the people of Israel. In, uh, of Israel. Jerusalem would, as the center of worship, uh, would not ultimately and fully be realized until the time of King David and his son Solomon. But only then would the temple be built and fully utilized as God had ultimately intended. The people of Israel would no longer worship God in a tabernacle moving from place to place, but in a temple, as the Bible teaches us, seated in the city of David in Jerusalem, and there Israel would worship the Lord their God. Jerusalem was Israel's center of worship. Now, not only would Jerusalem be the center of Israel's worship, if we can kind of, if you would, back away from that just for a moment. Uh, but but uh, would, uh, Jerusalem not only would be the center of Israel's worship, but it would play a significant role in God's future plan for the nations. Maybe as a small reminder that even as the temple was built by King David, it was expanded by Solomon and the people of Israel had the right to be there, you know, by, by God's bidding to worship him. We, we know that there was always a problem, that Israel was oftentimes disobedient. The, the Old Testament tells us that they were stiff-necked or that they were rebellious and that they were ultimately covenant breakers. You see, Israel was unlike the God that they were to serve. You see, the God that Israel served, we know was faithful. We know that the scripture teaches us that the God of Israel was a covenant keeper. Now, the question is, what was God ultimately to do? The next sub point that I would like us to pick up on is, is I want us to see Jerusalem's eschatological role. Jerusalem's eschatological role. What is eschatological? That's one of those $2 words, as we say down in Alabama. End times, right. The, the, the word eschatological comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. It's, it's really the idea of, of what's going on in that last or latter age. One of the key theme, themes in the book of Isaiah is the eschatological role of Jerusalem. Jerusalem would become the central place of the nations in God's saving purposes. When you look at the book of Isaiah, and especially the first half in chapters 1 through 39, you, the prophecy opens up uh, with the sure coming of God's judgment upon Jerusalem and concludes with affirmations of its certainty. God was going to judge Jerusalem. Why? Because of their sinfulness, because of their apostasy, because they worshiped false gods. Jerusalem in Isaiah, from Isaiah, Isaiah's point of view, Jerusalem must be cleansed and judgment will fall upon her. This was the promise made in the book of Isaiah. But yet within those first 39 chapters of Isaiah, God gives us these nuggets of hope. And they're not just nuggets of hope for you and I, but they were really nuggets of hope for the people of Israel. Notice if you would, what it says in Isaiah chapter 2. I don't have that for the screen, but Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 2 through 4. The prophet Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. 
Verse 2 says, It shall come to pass in the latter days. From Isaiah or the writer's perspective here, this is something that is, that is in the future. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain uh, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. This is a promise. And it's interesting how Jerusalem here or maybe Mount Zion is, is, is described as the highest of mountains, which we know it wasn't the highest of mountains. But the significance of the use of this term, all of the pagan deities were worshipped on mountaintops, represented not only in Israel, but really all over the world. Where, where did Zeus reside in the Greek world? Olympus. Mount Olympus, if you go to Guatemala today and, and you work amongst the Mayans, they will tell you north, out, see, uh, north, south, east, and west, and they're always pointing to a mountain. And on those mountains represents the various gods that they worship. But here, Isaiah, from that worldview and culture, notes that the Lord God, the, 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 the Lord of the Hebrew nation, the Lord of Israel, was the highest mountain, that he was the, the supreme God. And it says that he should be lifted up above the hills and all the nations, that is, those outside of Israel, would flow to it in the coming days. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may teach, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion, that is Jerusalem, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many people, and they shall beat their plores, their swords into plows shares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations or nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And it's interesting because Isaiah chapter 2 gives a unique perspective. And the question is, is how do you interpret it? Is, is he talking about the coming of Jesus the Messiah? Or is he talking about a future, maybe even something this future to us? And the question, I think the, the answer to that is, it's really both. And I'll tell you why it's both. Because oftentimes the prophets didn't have a clear view of all details. You've heard me use this example before, that if you could, just for illust uh, illustration point, that when the prophets looked, you know, through the quarter of time, through these prophetic visions that God had given him, it's almost like the prophets saw mountaintops. They saw this mountaintop and this mountaintop and this mountaintop. So in some way, somehow, the timeline maybe get run together. So what we have here is that the nation's flowing is representative of Jesus being the Messiah, but yet toward the end of this passage, uh, we see that there will be this great time of peace, which is, I I think representative at the end of the of the messianic age when Jesus reigns physically here upon this earth. If you or if you're in the book of Isaiah, turn over to Isaiah chapter eleven. Isaiah eleven. We have another kind of example of this where the messianic age is being talked about. And the messianic age, when, how many just would give it? When did the messianic age start? With Jesus, right? Jesus being the Messiah. And, and Jesus, during this church age, and we know that Jesus will return and that he will establish a kingdom upon earth, and there's where we know that he will rule and reign. So, so these passages kind of fit this, this larger messianic age. In chapter 11, we, we see that there. And it says, there shall come forth, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now, 
when we look at this illustrious, uh, this illustration, there's this stump. This stump represents ultimately uh, Israel and that has been judged, hewn down because of God's judgment. But yet from that stump shoots forth a rod. And that rod, the, the, the writer tells us, would bear much fruit. And talking about an individual, notice what it says in verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of count, uh, counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek uh, for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. This is a description of the person of Christ. He is the one that would have the spirit. He is the one that that would speak with wisdom. He is the one that would rule with righteousness. This is key to understanding Jerusalem in the, in the messianic age. The nations. And if you even skip down to verse 10 of chapter 11, notice what it says. And in that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. You see, the nations will make their pilgrimages uh, to Jerusalem at the end times, flocking to the banner of the messianic king. And here's something that I want us to see. Let's step back another moment. That when we started with Adam, and the promise was passed on to his son, Seth. And that promise was passed on to Noah. And Noah passed the promise of God on to Shem. And now we begin to see this line developing through which, remember, God promised that he would send a redeemer who would defeat the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We're continuing to see that line develop out in biblical history. Terah bore Abram. And Abram, and Abram bore Isaac, and Isaac was given the promise to, of Abraham. Then it was received by Jacob. And do you know who Jacob's descendant was? We've read here in chapter 11, Jesse. Jesse was a descendant or a son of Jacob. And who comes forth? Who is the descendant of Jesse? King, King David. King David. And it's ultimately through the line of King David, through the promise of the Old Testament, through which the Messiah would come. You see, all through this redemptive history, God was working out His promises through the nation of Israel and now through the city of Jerusalem. And thirdly, and, and I'll finish, this will be my last point, I want us to see Israel, Jerusalem, and the new covenant while Isaiah speaks of God's coming judgment to a rebellious Israel, Jeremiah picks up on that same theme, and he talks about God's imminent destruction of Jerusalem over their worship of false God. But yet, there's something unique to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah looks forward to a reconstituted nation. Jeremiah is often called the book of consolation, a book of consolation. He could see, God allowed him to see that the nation of Israel, despite their wickedness, despite their rebelliousness, that God would some way, somehow reconstitute a rebellious, dispersed, exiled nation. And in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verses 31 through 34, follow along with me if, as I read. Jeremiah, or, or Jeremiah the writer says, Behold, their days are coming, declares the Lord. 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you have to remember, God made a covenant through Abraham, but he also made a covenant through Moses. And this is where the law come up, uh, come in. And it dictated to Israel how they were to live in the land, the sacrifices that they would have to make, the calendar that they would have to keep, the observances that they would ultimately have to observe. But the problem is, is that Israel was wicked. Israel was rebellious. They began to worship other gods. And here Jeremiah receives the word of the Lord and the Lord declares, I am going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Why? Because Israel could not keep the old covenant. They couldn't do it. They couldn't keep the Mosaic covenant. Verse 32 of Jeremiah 31 says, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant uh, that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. And that that is how God is kind of displaying that Israel was like an unfaithful wife. Verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. In other words, this old covenant, which was supposed to display who God was, in some way, if, if Israel would keep and obey the law, would at least temporarily make them righteous. That because of their unfaithfulness, it didn't work. They didn't keep up, Israel didn't keep up their, their, their bargain. But this new covenant that God would establish was a promise for transformation, regardless of the faithfulness of Israel. He says, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor Things were going to change. In other words, it's not going to be like the old way. That no longer each one should teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, I know the Lord for they all know, uh, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. See, God is talking about something new. He's talking about something unique that there would be a new covenant in which uh, uh, forgiveness would be established not on the basis of, of Israel's faithfulness, but it would be based upon the faithfulness of God to Israel. And many times when we read a passage like this as Gentiles, we read ourselves into the immediate context of the, page, of, the, of the passage. And I would say to you, we shouldn't do that up front, that this new covenant has Israel in sight. Because the old covenant was made to Israel, the new covenant would be a reestablishment of God's relationship with them. You see, the promise of the new covenant is different from the old covenant. It's not conditional upon Israel. It cannot be broken. And this is God's promise to the nation of Israel. Later on, in Ezekiel 36, we see similar words referencing this new covenant. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 25 and 20 through 27 says this, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all of your transgressions and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your, uh, of your heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful and be careful to obey my rules. This is, will be what this was God's promise to Israel. And it's only after this new covenant is set that the Gentiles will be incorporated into God's new people. You are a part of God's redemptive plan. You are a part of God's redemptive plan. 
And I want you to see that. When we look at the TV and we think about all the things that's going on in the world and we recognize that this war going on in, is, in Israel has been going on for generation after generation after generation. And it's centered around the promise that God gave to Abraham that I will bless you, that I will give you many descendants, that I will make you the father of nations, and from you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That God, through various covenants, tried to bring Israel into right relationship with him, but the problem is Israel was so sinful they would never do it. They'd rather walk according to their own ways, to walk their own path. But God, in time and history, made a way and created such a covenant that he promised the surety of the redemption of his people, namely the children of Israel, and by God's grace, the Gentiles were grafted in at a later time. As we're going to see, as we see what's going on in Israel today, it's related to this story. The promise of the covenant and the fighting over the land but the surety that God will ultimately protect Israel. And we know that through the scriptures that Jerusalem will be a major part of God's redemptive story. This should be a reminder for us. Pray for peace in Israel. Pray for the salvation of Israel. Pray for, those, for the salvation of those who fight against Israel. Pray for the Gentile nations. And as a reminder, we should pray for our nation. I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit silly. Turn to the person beside you and say to them, I'm a part of God's plan. Okay? I hate when people tell me to do that. <laughs> but I've gotten old. And I thought, you know, it's really effective. <laughs> to verbally say something, right? That, that, that to realize that I am a part of, of God's plan. The you... No matter how insignificant that you may see yourself as in, in, in the bigger picture of God's plan, you are significant. Now, don't make yourself out something that you're not. You're not that important. <laughs> that was some pastoral wisdom and care there for a moment. But you should see yourselves part of what's going on, what God's doing. And here's the problem. This is really the overarching theme is missions here. And it's about reaching the world with the gospel. And here's what I'm getting at. That if you see yourself as insignificant, there is a very high percentage that you will not participate in what God is doing. Well, God doesn't need me. God doesn't need me. I'm not that important. I mean, I mean, Pastor Danny, I mean, God's going to use him, right? He's the pastor of our church. He preaches the word. He does this. He does that. But not little old me. Shouldn't see it that way. Shouldn't see it that way at all. You see, God is accomplishing his redemptive history, and we are a part of that. And as we watch what's going is on in is Israel, here's a word of, 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 of encouragement to you. Regardless of what happens there, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. You see, with Israel, win, lose, or draw on this day, or win, lose, and draw over the next several months, win, lose, or draw, God will win in the end. And he will not be thwarted, nor will his plans. As biblical prophecy plays out before us, do not think that we have no part in his divine plan because we do. We are part of the nations in God's plan. And no matter where we are in, in God's timeline, whether the end is tomorrow or the end is a thousand years from now, he uses his people to accomplish his, his, to accomplish his purpose. We are not his chosen nation. 
but we are a part of his chosen people. We are the children of Abraham by faith in the Messiah. Now, I want to say two things. Today's message really addresses two groups of people. Here's the first group. The first group is those who truly know the Lord. But the question is, are you a participant in God's mission in the world? In other words, not do you intellectually know that you are, but are you actively participating in God's mission in the world? And this is not something that a, that a true believer of Christ, I would say, can separate himself or divorce himself from. If you know Jesus, you must recognize that you're a part of his plan. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. But he has ordained that all of his children participate in his mission in the world. He has established a new covenant, one in which the Gentiles are grafted into the vine. His followers are now part of his mission, making disciples of all nations. And we do this corporately. We do it individually. But we do it corporately as a church. And it is the church who must take the gospel to the world. But what about this number two? Well, not yet. I want to talk about maybe individual responsibility of believers. I want to encourage you this week. Take the opportunity to bear witness, to bear testimony of your new life in Christ. Listen to me. You don't have to be an apologist. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. Well, all you need to do is tell someone what Jesus has done to you. What Jesus means to you. How Jesus has changed your life. Maybe this week it, it can be something more. Maybe you just don't have to dare bear testimony of how Jesus has changed your life. But maybe you can share the gospel, the good news. Maybe you can share about the death and the resurrection of Christ and what was accomplished upon the cross. Look for opportunity this week. Become a part of his plan for the nations. And listen to me. If you're like me, I just make excuses. I'm too busy. I'm this. I don't know that many people. All the people around me are Christians. Da, 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 da. Make excuses. Listen, begin to pray for opportunities. And I assure you that if you pray for those opportunities, you know what God will do? He will fling that door wide open. He will fling it open. And for those of you that may be here this morning, that do not know the Lord, that do not know Christ, that have not trusted by Christ by faith, the question is, do you want to know him? Do you want to know him? Do you, this mission, this redemptive plan that's going on in the world, do you want to be a part of that? Is there something about the Christian message that makes you go, you know what? That's what I'm missing. That's what I need. To you, I will tell you this morning, the only way into this group of people is that you must come to him by faith. Just as Abraham came by faith. Just as the Apostle Paul came by faith. You too must come by faith. And if, 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 if this is a point of contention to, for, uh, for you, listen, after this service, I'm going to be available. Pastor Johnny will be available. Our elders will be available. Tom will be available. Jan will be available. My wife will be available. Anybody will be available. To, if this is a point of contention and you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, you don't know for certain whether or not that when you die, you're going to go to, go to heaven, you, you can leave here today with, the assurance, with God's assurance. Come and talk to us. And if you, my hope and prayer is that you can leave here today with the assurance that you are in Christ and you're part of his plan for the nations. And as God's children living in the modern world, we must take our eyes off of ourselves. We must focus on the life that we have in Christ and obey what he calls us to do. We must bear testimony of him and make disciples wherever we may go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Lord, we think about all that you're doing in the world. There's wars and there's even rumors of greater wars where it looks through human eyes for those of us that know you, Father, it looks like the end is near. But Father, we must confess that even though it looks clear to us, we have not absolute certainty. So in moments like these, we trust you. We trust that you're at work in this world. We trust that you're accomplishing your will. We trust that you are still saving souls. And so this very reason, we pray for the Jewish people of Israel. We pray for the Palestinians. We pray for Hamas. We pray for the Iranians. We pray for the Arab world that they would all turn to you and accept Jesus as the Messiah. For the only peace that will ever happen in the Middle East will only come when you are established as the Messiah and you are established upon the throne of David where you will rule. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of knowing you. And as, as Gentile followers grafted into that vine, may we be faithful to take the gospel to the nations, to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.